Some of you have seen our video, Bandsaw Magic, making a little known trick a little more known. Well, that, it turns out, was part one. And welcome to part two. Should you need a recap, we explained an ancient piece of woodworking prestidigitation in which you take an ordinary block of wood, check that there's nothing up its sleeves, cut a curve in one face, turn the block of wood 90 degrees, and cut another curve. Then take the pieces and turn the outside corners in. You'll find that those boringly flat surfaces have disappeared, and what you're left with is something quite enchanting. We then showed you how you could take this magic and make a lamp base, a set of shelves, and a hideous table that everyone seemed to love except me. Some of you kind folks actually offered to give it a home. And there were questions, great questions, and brilliant suggestions. So in part two, we're going to answer the questions, review the suggestions, and take this bit of magic and push it even further. So hold on to your wands. I'm going to show you the best blades for this particular magic. <laughs> also, some really cool patterns, some imaginative shapes, and finally, a true cabrio leg. Sorry about that. If you'd like to skip ahead to any one of these sections, the uh, time codes are in the video descriptions. The most common question was, what blade do I use? Well, that depends on two things, the grain direction of the workpiece and the gradius of the curves that you want to cut. You see, bandsaw teeth have a set, and by that I mean they're bent left and right in a repeating pattern. Because of the set, the blade will cut a curve slightly wider than the blade itself. This ensures that the blade doesn't get stuck in the cut and it also makes it possible for you to cut curves. As you're cutting, you can turn the blade in the kerf. Well, actually, you're turning the kerf around the blade, and this results in a curved cut. But you can only turn the wood so far until the back of the blade rubs up against the side of the kerf. This limits the radius. So what's the tightest radius you can cut with any given blade? Well, for Bandsaw Magic Part 1, we use two blades. A quarter inch or 16 millimeter blade that will cut a radius of 5 eighths of an inch or 16 millimeters. This served well for most of the cuts that I made, but a few of those curves were tighter than that, and for these I had to switch to a 3 16 inch or 4 millimeter blade. This will cut a radius of 3 eighths of an inch or 9.5 millimeters. Both of these blades are available with standard tooth spacing. That's about 14 to 18 teeth per inch. Or skip tooth spacing, 4 to 6 teeth per inch. Why the difference? Well, when you're cutting, sawdust packs into the gullets. Those are the spaces between the teeth. Once the gullets are full, the blade won't cut anymore until it exits the workpiece and the gullets clear. The standard teeth work best for cutting across the grain. The cutting action chops the wood into tiny fibers that fit neatly into the small gullets. The skip tooth also does a good job of cutting cross grain, but it really sings and dances when cutting with the grain. The wood peels off in long curls, and you need the large gullets to clear the waste. The standard blade will make a smoother cut, but the skip tooth is the way to go when you, the cut follows the grain. The curves that we cut with this technique wander back and forth across the grain but by and large, they follow the grain. So we're going to use the skip tooth blades. In my book, Using the Bandsaw, I put all this information in a single chart of common bandsaw blades. Now, I've redone this chart so that all the measurements are in both English and metric, and you can get it free from the Workshop Companion store. The link is in our video description.
Let's try some new wood patterns. I love to mix different species of woods. When you cut through the layers at an angle or a curve, you can get some awesome effects. And this technique provides an awesome opportunity to do just that. Now we found in part one that these wood patterns should have strong horizontal or vertical lines so that when you turn the outside corners in, the layers match up. With that in mind, here are three new candidates. This workpiece has alternating vertical stripes of walnut and poplar. Viewed from the top, these make a checkerboard pattern. On this one, we've cut the vertical stripes into layers to form a checkerboard on the sides. Lots of strong vertical and horizontal lines in this one. And just for kicks, we're going to try this chevron pattern. Now, I know that this seems to contradict what I just said about horizontal and vertical lines, but this does have a distinct horizontal line on the side, and they should match up when we turn the pieces outside in. I've made absolutely sure that all the corners on all the work pieces are perfectly square and the outside surfaces are flat as a die. I've also checked the bandsaw to make sure that the blade is square to the table. Any deviation in the squareness of the workpiece or the machine setup could prevent the patterns from lining up properly after we cut them. I'm going to cut a Sima curve in all of these pieces so that we get a good comparison. <laughs> All done. Now, let's turn these things outside in and see what we get. Here are the walnut and poplar stripes. Whoa, uh, I didn't see that coming. Ah, the stripes turned into checkers and the length of the stripe depends upon how long the blade was in each stripe. Wow, pretty cool. Now here we have the checkered piece. And I want to point out that this is checkered all the way through. And we have both large checkers and small ones. And here we go. Well, this is a, a little disappointing. It almost hurts to look at. I think what this tells us is the smaller the checkers are, the harder they are going to be to line up. This might have worked a whole lot better if we'd just used bigger checkers. Okay, and last, we have here the chevron, or the herringbone if you're so inclined. And here is what you get. Pretty nice, huh? You can see the zigzags right there. Now, one of the reasons this worked out as nicely as it did is that when we assembled the stock, we made absolutely sure that the peak of the chevrons were right in the middle of the board. And as you can see, it paid off. And here they are, side by side. Now I think that what we can conclude from this experiment is not only is it important that the layers line up horizontally and vertically, we can also say, generally, that the bigger the pattern, the better the results. This technique tends to slice things up into smaller pieces. So a pattern like this checkerboard here can become quite busy. On the other hand, what happened with the stripes was quite surprising, and pleasantly so. I would encourage you to experiment with your own patterns. It can be quite an adventure. Folks ask about shapes, both the shape of the workpiece and the shapes of the curves to be cut. And the question that came up the most often was, do the cuts have to be symmetrical? In other words, do you have to make the same cut on each face? And the answer is no, you don't. The cuts can be wildly different, and the result will be a wild leg, or a wild lamp base, or whatever. This simple shape was made with two different cuts. There's a Sima curve on one face, and a simple arc on the other. Let's put it together and see what we get. And there you go. Not exactly wild, perhaps, but all the parts fit. <laughs> and it makes my point. You know, 
you don't even have to plan your cuts. You can cut whichever way the spirit moves you. Let's try something just for kicks, something I've never attempted before. I'm going to start by cutting that ubiquitous Sima curve I'm so fond of. Then I'm going to turn the leg over and cut a Sima on steroids, one that actually reverses direction and goes back up the leg for a short distance. Because these curves are so tight, I've switched to a 3 16 inch blade, that's four millimeters, for the second cut. All right, let's see what we've got. That's sort of unexpected, isn't it? I guess this could be a desk leg with its own pencil edge, a place to hang a purse or a backpack, a handhold, some scrap wood for your fire. There are lots of possibilities here, some of them quite preposterous. Next question, does the stock have to be square? Well, it has to have four square corners, but the cross section can either be a square or a rectangle. I'm going to take this rectangular piece of wood and cut a Sima curve in the face, then turn it 90 degrees and cut an arc in the edge. And as you're about to see, the parts go back together in exactly the same manner as the square stock, but uh, produce a slightly different and flatter effect. Can the stock be tapered? Well, yes it can. In fact, there are two ways to make these tapers, and I'm going to show you both. Let's start with the easy way. Cut a tapered workpiece. These tapers must start at one end and go all the way to the other. You cannot leave a post, an untapered section, at the top or anywhere else on your workpiece. Cut curves in one tapered face and tape the parts back together. Then cut the curves in the adjacent face, just as you would do with straight stock. When you turn the outside corners in, here's what you get. A curvy piece that tapers from one end to the other. But you can also cut the taper after you've made your initial curves. This method allows you to uh, taper or modify a section of the workpiece rather than the entire length. Let me show you what I'm about to do in just two dimensions using this template. We've already split the stock with our initial cuts. We're now going to take this part, move it over here, and then cut away this part. The stock now tapers from here to here. After making the initial curved cuts, mark the parts one, two, three, and four. Take parts one and two and move them so their flat surfaces are against three and four, as so. Now we're going to tape everything together. Now mark your taper. Cut the taper and save the scrap. Remove the tape and put everything back together so the stock is square. Then turn it 90 degrees and we're going to do it all over again. Remove the tape and this time we can get rid of all the scrap. And there you go. If you'd like to have a better idea of what this is going to look like all finished, well, I've already showed it to you. It's right here. As you can see, this would make a really beautiful leg that tapers from the top to the bottom, or a really wimpy lamp base that tapers from the bottom to the top. The possibilities just explode. And one of those possibilities is that we can use this amended technique to make a true cabrio leg, one that tapers from the knee down to the ankle. In fact, this particular cabrio has a second taper. The sole tapers up to the top of the foot. Now let me show you what we're about to do once again using a template. Here is the initial shape that we will be cutting in each face. When you take the pieces and put them together like this, 
Uh, you sort of have something that reminds you of a cabriole leg, but one with very fat ankles. In fact, I think this is what you would call a cankle. But with a little cosmetic surgery, there you go. Now the leg is looking very cabriole. I've already made the initial cuts. And as you can see, I have a cabriole leg with a cankle. I've also marked the parts one, two, three, and four so I can keep track of them. I'm going to put this back together in a square and we'll begin the cosmetic surgery. Let's split off three and four from one and two and move them like so and tape them together. Now, let's mark the tapers that we're going to cut. There's the taper in the cankle. And I'm also going to mark the taper in the foot. Make the cuts, but remember to save the scrap. Remove the tape and put the pieces back together again to form square stock. You can omit those little pieces that you cut off the bottom part of the foot. Turn the stock 90 degrees and let's do this all over again. Well, the patient apparently has survived. So, let's remove the scrap and put the pieces together. And, lo and behold, a cabriole leg. And here's what it looks like after you glue the parts together and do a little sanding. Pretty handsome, huh? Now, I know I told you in the previous video that you could not use bandsaw magic to make a true cabriole leg, and I was dead wrong. All it took was a little imagination and experimentation. I sure showed me.